Good evening. So, I'm going to continue uh, reading from American Fairy Tales by L. Frank Baum. And um, he's uh, this interesting book, you know, L. Frank Baum, you know, as I talked about before, was known for The Wizard of Oz. And The Wizard of Oz was uh, inter entertaining as a fairy tale, right? Entertaining as a story, piece of sort of cultural mythology. At the same time, it was very, very enter um, entertaining as a political commentary. And a lot of the things that he talked about were very relevant to the time that, you know, he was writing in. So it was a way to entertain, but also a way to educate. And one of the other things that he did is a series of American fairy tales that he wanted to be distinct and related uh, to what it was to be an American and how to understand yourselves in sort of the broader context of um, the Western world and the world in general. And sometimes, you know, you run into things that are from an earlier age and reflect values that we had sort of evolved. Uh, but, you know, it's not as uh, profound a difference as you find in someone like H.P. Lovecraft or uh, Robert E. Howard or, you know, other people writing in related genres in, uh, you know, time that he was writing. Uh, this particular story is the third one in, um, let's see, American Fairy Tales, and it's called The Queen of Cluck, and uh, I think you'll find it entertaining. Um, this is about uh, wealth and marriage and inheritance and what it is to do the right thing, uh, which are, you know, some of the themes that, you know, he's covered again and again for us. So without further ado, I'm going to get right to it. And this is the Queen of Clock. A king once died, as kings do, being I, um, as liable to shortness of breath as other mortals. It was high time this king abandoned his earth life, for he had lived in a sadly extravagant manner, and his subjects could spare him without the slightest inconvenience. His father had left him a full treasury, both money and jewels being in abundance, but the foolish king, just deceased, had squandered every penny in riotous living. He had then taxed his subjects until most of them became paupers, and this money vanished in more riotous living. Next, he sold all the grand old furniture in the palace, all the silver and gold plate and bric-a-bac, all the rich carpets and furnishings, and even his own kingly wardrobe, reserving only a soiled and moth-eaten ermine robe to fold over his threadbare raiment. And he spent the money in further riotous living. Don't ask me to explain what riotous living is. I only know from hearsay there's an excellent way to get rid of money. And so, this spendthrift king found it. He now picked all the magnificent jewels from his kingly crown and from the round ball on top of his scepter and sold them and spent the money. Riotous living, of course. Probably Epstein in Mar-a-Lago, I'm not totally certain. But at last he was at the end of his resources. He couldn't sell the crown itself because no one but the king had the right to wear it. Neither could he sell the royal palace because only the king had the right to live there. So, finally, he found himself reduced to a bare palace containing only a big mahogany bedstead where he slept in, a small stool on which he set, uh, sat to pull off his shoes and a moth-eaten ermine rug. In this strait, he was reduced to the necessity of borrowing an occasional dime from his chief counselor with which to buy a ham sandwich. And the chief counselor hadn't many dimes. One who counseled his king so foolishly was likely to ruin his own prospects as well. So the king, having nothing more to live for, died suddenly and left a ten-year-old son to inherit the dismantled kingdom, the moth-eaten robe, and the jewel-stripped crown. No one envied the child, who had scarcely been thought of until he became king himself. Then he was recognized as a personage of some importance, and the politicians and hangers-ons, headed by the chief counselor of the kingdom, held a meeting to determine what could be done for him. These folks had helped the old king to live riotously while his money lasted, and now they were poor and too proud to work. So they tried to think of a plan that would bring more money into the little king's treasury, where it could be handy for them to help themselves. After the meeting was over, the chief counselor came to the young king, who was playing peg-top in the court, and said, Your Majesty, we have thought of a way to restore your kingdom to its former power and magnificence. All right, replied his majesty carelessly, but how will you do that? By marrying you to a lady of great wealth, replied the counselor. Marrying me, cried the king. Well, I'm only ten years old. I know. It is to be regretted, but your majesty will grow older, and the affairs of the kingdom demand that you marry a wife. Can I marry a mother instead? asked the poor little king, who had lost his mother when he was a baby. Now, it has been argued that that's all most men are achieving anyhow, but that's another story. Certainly not, declared the counselor. To marry a mother would be illegal. To marry a wife is right and proper. 
Can you marry her yourself? inquired the Majesty, aiming his peg top at the Chief Counselor's toe, and laughing to say we jumped to escape it. Let me explain, said the other. You haven't a penny in the world, and you have a kingdom. There are many rich women who would be glad to give their wealth in exchange for a queen's coronet, even if the king is but a child. So, we have decided to advertise that the one who bids the highest should become the Queen of Cook. If I must marry at all, said the king after a moment's thought, I prefer to marry Nianna, the armorer's daughter. But she is too poor, replied the counselor. Her teeth are pearls, her eyes are amethyst, and her hair is gold, declared the uh, little king. True, your majesty. But consider that your wife's health, wealth must be used. How would Nianna look after you had pulled out her teeth of pearls, plucked out her amethyst eyes, and shaved her golden head? The boy shuddered. Have your own way, he said despairingly. Only let the lady be as dainty as possible and a good playfellow. We shall do our best, returned the chief counselor, and what a way to advertise throughout the kingdoms for a wife for the boy king of Quok. There were so many applicants for the privilege of marrying the little king that it was decided to put him up at auction in order that the largest possible sum of money should be brought into the kingdom. So, on the day appointed, the ladies gathered at the palace from all the surrounding kingdoms, from Bilka and Mulgravia and Junkum, and even as far away as the Republic of Infelt. The chief counselor came to the palace early in the morning and had the king's face washed and his hair combed, and then he patted inside the crown with old newspapers to make it small enough to fit on the king's head. It was a sorry-looking crown, having many big and little holes in it where the jewels had once been, and it had been neglected and knocked around until it was quite battered and tarnished. Yet... As the counselor said, it was the king's crown, and it was quite proper he should wear it on this solemn occasion, on the solemn occasion of his auction. Like all boys, be they kings or paupers, his majesty had torn and soiled his one suit of clothes so that they were hardly presentable, and there was no money to buy new ones. Therefore the counselor wound the old ermine robe around the king and sat him upon the stool in the middle of the otherwise empty audience chamber, and around him stood all the courtiers and politicians and hangers-on of the kingdom. Consisting of such people who were too proud or too lazy to work for a living. There was great there were a great number of them, you may be sure, and they made an imposing appearance. Then the doors of the audience chamber were thrown open, and the wealthy ladies who aspired to the, be the Queen of Coke came trooping in. The king looked them over with much anxiety and decided they were each all old enough to be his grandmother, and ugly enough to scare away the crows from the royal cornfields. After which he lost interest in them. But the, the, but, the rich lady, but the rich lady has never looked at the poor little king squatting upon the stool. They gathered at once about the chief counselor who acted as auctioneer. How much am I offered for the coronet of the Queen of Coke? asked the counselor in a loud voice. Where is the coronet? inquired a fussy old lady who had just buried her ninth husband and his worth several millions. Well, there isn't any coronet at present, explained the chief counselor, but whoever bids high enough will have the right to wear one, and she can buy it. Oh, said the fussy old lady. I see. Then she added, I'll bid fourteen dollars. Fourteen thousand dollars! cried a sour-looking woman who was thin and tall and had wrinkles all over her skin. Like a frosted apple, the king thought. The bidding now became fast and furious, and the poverty-stricken courtiers brightened up as the sum began to mount into the millions. He'll bring us a very pretty fortune after all, whispered one to his comrade, and then we shall have the pleasure of helping him spend it the king began to be anxious. All the women who looked at all kind-hearted or pleasant had stopped bidding for lack of money, and the slender old dame with the wrinkles seemed determined to get the coronet at any price, and with it the boy husband. This ancient creature finally became so excited that her wig got crosswise on her head, and her false teeth kept slipping out, which horrified little king greatly, but she would not give up. At last the chief ounceler um, ended the auction by crying out, Sold to Mary Ann Brzezinski de la Porcus! For three million nine hundred thousand six hundred and twenty-four dollars and sixteen cents, and the sour-looking old woman paid the money in cash on the spot, which proves this is a fairy story. The king was so disturbed at the thought that he must marry this hideous creature that he began to wail and weep. Whereupon the woman boxed his ears soundly, but the counselor reproved her for punishing her husband in public, saying, "You're not married yet. Wait until tomorrow after the wedding takes place. Then you can abuse him as much as you wish." But at present, we prefer to have people think this is a love match. The poor king slept little that night, so filled was he with the, was, with the terror of his future life. Nor could he get, any idea, get the idea out of his head that he preferred to marry the armorer's daughter, who was about his own age. 
He tossed and tumbled around in his hard bed until the moonlight came in and the window in at the window and lay like a great white sheet upon the bare floor. Finally, in turning over for the hundredth time, his hand struck against a secret spring in the headboard of the big mahogany bedstead, and at once, with a sharp click, a panel flew open. The noise caused the king to look up, and seeing the open panel, he stood upon tiptoe, and, reaching within, threw out a folded paper. It had several leaves fastened together like a book, and upon the first page was written, When the king is in trouble, this leaf he must double, and set it on fire to obtain his desire. This was not very good poetry. But when the king had spelled it out in the moonlight, he was filled with joy. There's no doubt about my being in trouble, he exclaimed. Swell burn at once and see what happens. He tore off the leaf and put the rest of the book in its secret place. Then folding the paper double, he placed it on top of the stool, lighted a match and set fire to it. It made a horrid smudge for so small a paper, and the king sat on the edge of the bed and watched it eagerly. When the smoke cleared away, he was surprised to see, sitting upon the stool, a round little man who, with folded arms and crossed legs, sat calmly facing the king and smoking a black briarwood pipe. Well, here I am, said he. So I see, replied the little king. But how did you get here? Why didn't you burn the paper? demanded the round man by way of answer. Well, yes, I did, acknowledged the king. Well, then you're in trouble, and I've come to help you out of it. I'm the slave of the royal bedstead. Oh, I didn't know there was one, said the king. But neither did your father. It would not have been so foolish as to sell everything he had for money. By the way, it's lucky for you he did not sell this bedstead. Now then, what do you want? I'm not sure what I want, replied the king, but I know what I don't want, and that's I don't want to marry this old woman tomorrow. Well, that's easy enough, said the slave of the royal bedstead. All ye do is return her body. She paid to the chief counselor and declared the match off. Don't be afraid. You're the king, and your word is law. But to be sure, said the majesty, but I'm in a great need of money. How am I going to live if the chief counselor returns to Marianne Brzezinski her millions? Whew! That's easy enough. I can answer the man, and putting his hand in his pocket, he drew out and tossed to the king an old-fashioned leather purse. Keep that with you, said he, and you'll always be rich. For you can take out the purse as many twenty-five cent silver pieces as you wish, one at one at a time. Now, no matter how often you take one out, another will instantly appear at its place within the purse. Thank you, said the king gratefully. You have rendered me a rare favor, for now I shall have money for all my needs and will not be obliged to marry anyone. Thank you a thousand times. Don't mention it, answered the other, puffing his pipe slowly and watching the smoke curl into the moonlight. Such things are easy to be. Is that all you'll be wanting? All I can think of just now, returned the king. Then please, close the secret panel in the bedstead, said the man. Then the leaves of the book may have be used to you at some time. The boy stood upon the bed as before, and, reaching up, closed the opening so that no one else could discover it. Then he turned to face his visitor, but the slave of the royal bedstead had disappeared. I expected that, said his majesty, and I'm sorry I did not wait to say goodbye. Delighted with a lightened heart and a sense of great relief, the boy placed the leathern purse underneath his pillow and climbed into bed, again sleeping soundly until morning. When the sun rose, his majesty rose also, refreshed and comforted, and the first thing he did was send for the chief counselor. The mighty personage arrived, looking glum and unhappy, but the boy was too full of his own good fortune to notice it, said he, I have decided not to marry anyone, for I have just come into a fortune of my own. Therefore, I command you to return to that old woman the money she paid you for the right to wear the coronet of the Queen of Coke and make public declaration that the wedding will not take place. Hearing this, the counselor began to tremble, for he saw the young king had decided to reign in earnest, and he looked so guilty that his majesty inquired, Well, what's the matter now? Sire, replied the wretch in shaking voice, I... I cannot return the money to her. I have lost it. Lost it, cried the king in mingled astonishment and anger. Even so, your majesty, on my way home from the auction last night, I stopped at the drugstore to get some potash lozenges for my throat, which was dry and hoarse, with so much loud talking. My efforts. And your majesty will admit it was through my efforts that the woman was reduced, induced to pay so great a price. Well, going into the drugstore, I carelessly left the package of money lying in the seat of my carriage, and when I came out, it was gone. Nor was there a thief anywhere in sight. Did you call the police? asked the king. Yes, I called, but they were all on the next block, and although they have promised to search for the robber, I have little hope they will ever find him, the king sighed. 
What shall we do now? he asked. I fear you must marry Marianne Brzezinski, answered the chief counselor, unless indeed you order the executioner to cut her head off. That would be wrong, declared the king. The woman must not be harmed. It is not just that we, it's not just for us not to return her money, for I will not but I will not marry her under any circumstances. Is that private fortune you mentioned large enough to repay her? asked the counselor. Well, yes, said the king thoughtfully, but it will take some time to do it, and that shall be your task. Call the woman here. The counselor went in search of Marianne, who, when she heard she was not to become a queen, but would receive her money back, flew into a violent passion and boxed the chief counselor's ears so viciously that they stung for nearly an hour. But she followed him into the king's audience chamber, where she demanded her money in a loud voice, claiming, as well, the interest due upon it overnight. The counselor has lost your money, said the boy king, but he shall pay you every penny out of my own private purse. I fear, however, you'll be obligated to take it in small change. That will not matter, she said, scowling upon the counselors as if she longed to re box his ears again. I don't care how small the change is, so long as I get every penny that belongs to me and the interest. What is it? Here, answered the king, handing the counselor the leathern purse. It's all in silver quarters, and they must be taken from the purse one at a time. But there will be plenty to pay your demands and to spare. So, there being no chairs, the counselor sat down upon the floor in one corner and began counting out silver twenty-five cent pieces from the purse one by one. And the old woman sat upon the floor opposite him and took each piece of the money from his hand. It was a large sum, three million nine hundred thousand six hundred and twenty-four dollars and sixteen cents. And it takes four times as many 25 cent pieces as it would dollars to make up that amount. The king left them sitting there and went to school, and often thereafter he came to the counselor and interrupted him long enough to get from the purse what money he needed to reign in proper and in a dignified manner. This somewhat delayed the conning, but it was a long job anyway that did not seem to matter much. The king grew to manhood and married the pretty daughter of the armor, and they now have two lovely children of their own. Once in a while, they go into the big audience chamber of the palace and let the little ones watch the aged, hoary-headed counselor count out silver 25-cent pieces to a withered old woman, who watched his every moment to see that he does not cheat her. It is a big sum, three million nine hundred thousand six hundred and twenty-four dollars and sixteen cents and twenty-five cent pieces. But this is how the counselor was punished for being so careless with a woman's money, and this is how I marry Anne Brzezinski de la Porcus was also punished for wishing to marry a ten-year-old king in order that she might wear the coronet of the Queen of Coke. There you go. Third story in American Fairy Tales by L. Frank Baum. Um, perhaps you can see some, you know, echoes and applications in our current environment. I think that's the strength of fairy tales, um, especially ones written with a specific place and historical moment in, in mind, uh, which this is. Well, I will be giving you some more of these, uh, trying to do these every uh, day or so, and um, tomorrow we'll do the next one. Thank you so much for watching, and you have an absolutely wonderful night.